Hey everybody and welcome to Spreading Positivity with Mayor K. I'm Mayor K and on today's show we have Jeffrey Gurion. Jeffrey is a cosmetic dentist, a former clinical professor at a major New York University in the oral medicine, oral facial pain department, a lecturer, a comedy writer for many big stars. He's an author, a radio TV personality, and a healer. Jeffrey. Good to have you here, my man. Mayor, thanks so much. And it's a great honor to be on your first show. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's really cool. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah for you, are our first guest, we are, uh, we are podcasting here today. Um, this is a, you know, a passion project that I've been thinking about for some time. And I teamed up with my boy, Brandon, here, Reese. And uh, mm-hmm. we are taking it. We're plunging in. And uh, thank you for coming out on this incredible, beautiful Tuesday morning. Absolutely. I don't get up this early for just anybody, you know. Ah, all right. <laughs> I uh, take that. Thank you very, very much. Very welcome, so, yeah. for those, I mean, Jeffrey, you know, you've come on my radar just recently, and I'm, you know, just doing little research that I've done on you. It's, it's been quite, you're quite, quite a character. You've been around the comedy world for some time, and um, just to delve into, for those who aren't listening, who are listening, who don't know too much about you, I want to fill us in a bit about your story and like where you come from and how you got into what you're doing today. Well, I, I broke into comedy the usual way. I, uh, I went to dental school, which is, <laughs> I guess, what most people do. If I, if I had known that you didn't have to do that, it would have been a lot easier. But uh, I started writing comedy when I was 12 years old, which was at the time that I decided that I wanted to be a dentist. And I must have been a very strange kid because most children do not want to be dentists. Right. But, uh, <laughs> or, uh, you know, they usually want to be something very exciting. But I had my goals cut out for me. And I. What do you I, think that, that interest of dentistry uh, came from? Well, I knew I wanted to be a doctor of some kind. And I knew that I was too sensitive to handle life and death situations. And I was already going to an orthodontist, and I liked the idea of making people look nice. Hmm. That was always important to me. My specialty became cosmetic dentistry. And, you know, I love making people look beautiful. That's, that's a, a wonderful thing to do. And people and look it, most beautiful with a smile on their face. Exactly. And it's part of my goal has always been to put positive energy out to the universe. So I was already writing comedy when I was 12 years old. I was writing things for the amusement of my friends. And, and I always, you know, um, those were my two main interests. And I never changed my mind. And I could never decide which one I wanted to do. So I wound up doing both. And um, in the early days of Saturday Night Live, I was driving a car that I could only describe as a pimp mobile. It was a, a Mandarin orange Eldorado that had been made for one of the Isley brothers. And he decided not to take it, and I bought it. Uh, I went to a place in the Bronx, and I bought this amazing car, and I got a Rolls-Royce grill for it. Many, many years before MTV even existed, well before they had Pimp My Ride, you know? Yeah, this sure. car was amazing. Big white wall tires, straps in the back, and it had doctor's plates on it, which was very confusing to all the hookers and police <laughs> and pimps. Everyone who saw the car, no one knew what to make of it because no one drove a car like that. And my wife would say to me, we're Jewish and we live in Scarsdale. Why am I driving <laughs> an orange Cadillac? She didn't get it. But anyway, I was making... Um, films at the time. I was shooting little films on the street, and they were kind of false news items, like several men were arrested for smearing cream cheese on the ankles of elderly women who wore their stockings rolled down like bagels. <laughs> you know how the old women, they <laughs> wear their great. stockings around their yeah, ankles? Sure. looks like bagels to me. So I got my dear grandmother, who, who was born in this country and had no accent, but she made believe she had a Jewish accent, and she let me put cream cheese on her ankles. And she said, you know, we have two kind of stockings, one for milk and one for meat. That's she amazing, said, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and, and this crazy man, he smeared cream cheese on my meat stockings, and I can't get it off. Oh, wow. And, and I zoomed in with the camera on her ankles, and she said, Jeffrey, only for you would I do this. That's so, true love right there, when you allow someone to smear cream cheese on your ankles. Cream cheese on their ankles. And you have to be very sick to do that to your own grandmother. <laughs> 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 so I, so I, I, I made it into films, and I brought it down to Saturday Night Live. And in those days, there was no terrorism, and you could pull right up to the building at 30 Rockefeller Plaza. Uh, And I did that, and I'm driving this orange Cadillac, and it had a CB radio, which a lot of your listeners won't even know what that is, but it was before cell phones. They had CBs that you would talk to people on the road, the CB radio, and mine was in the shape of a telephone. So I drove up to 30 Rock, as if I was on the phone in this big orange Cadillac with a Rolls Royce grill, and I threw the doorman a couple of bucks, and I said, watch my car, Lorne Michaels is expecting me. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Watch my car. Lorne Michaels is expecting me. Mm-hmm. Lorne Michaels never heard of me. Lorne Michaels was the creator and producer of Saturday Night Live and has been for over 40 years. So I go in the building and I sneak past the security guards because you could do that in those days. If right. you tried that now, they would shoot at you. But in those <laughs> days, you could do it. And I snuck up to Saturday Night Live and I met Alan Zweibel, who was one of the head writers of the show at the time, who has gone on to become an Emmy Award winning writer, producer, director, everything. I had. He was just at the 92nd Street Y a few nights ago. I was yes. there with him with Susie Essman from mm. Curb Your Enthusiasm and yes. Louis Black, you know. And so Alan saw my my films, The Cream Cheese on the Ankles, which he has never forgotten to this day. Sure, who would? Reminds me, it's an image sure that you can't get out of your yeah. mind. Yeah. And, um, and he introduced me to his manager, a man named David Jonas, who just passed away a few years ago at 100 years old. Wow. And he was managing Freddie Prinze at the time, the original Freddie Prinze. He had gotten him the, the TV show Chico and the Man, and he's the guy that started me in comedy as a result of me bringing those crazy films to Saturday Night Live. And that's how I got started. And then, I got, and then it took me about a year to learn how to write a joke because it's very hard to write a joke. I was thinking cream cheese on the ankles. I was writing <laughs> sketches, you know? And... Uh, and then I got started writing for comedians. And the first big star I ever wrote for was Rodney Dangerfield for his album and for The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Got it. So wow. that's, how, that's, that's how I got started. That's amazing. Wow, wow, wow. That's amazing. So did you actually, going back just a bit, do you, did you feel like you got your funny bone from like your mom, your dad? Was it just you know growing up around the neighborhood from friends? That's Who's a good question. Who's that? Yeah. My dad, uh, both my parents were wonderful people and both had a great sense of humor. But my dad started taking me to comedy films when I was a little kid. He instilled that in me. He had a great sense of humor. I was always kidding around. And, uh, and he took me to see, you know, uh, the Marx Brothers and uh, Laurel and Hardy mm. and uh, any, you know, any of the comedy films that were popular in those days. And I really believe that he instilled that in me. It was always always had a joke and was just a funny guy, you know. And so, I, I, to me, comedy was the best. I remember as a kid, the Ed Sullivan show would come on, and I would just run in to see if there was a comedian on. I would be glued to the TV. It was wow. it's a fascinating. It was always fascinating to me to go out and make people laugh. That's incredible. So from 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 learning to be a dentist, from to to comedy, and so when when you moved into into the comedy world, how was that? Um, you know, how has comedy you feel like shifted from when you just started to what comedy is today? Is it has it has it changed much? Is it pretty? Yeah, much it's changed so much. God, it's changed so much. Today, m- most comedians are storytellers. They're not telling jokes the way they used to. There are still a few. You know, Judah Friedlander will tell jokes. Gilbert Gottfried is amazing. I love people that are unique. Those guys are very unique. There's no one who's like them, you know. Um, Jerry Seinfeld, who I saw again recently, I was at his Netflix taping um, at the comic strip. I did the book on the comic strip with Chris Rock, who wrote a great introduction. The comic strip opened in 1976, and that's the club where Jerry Seinfeld started. It's the club where Eddie Murphy was discovered, where Chris Rock was discovered, Ray Romano started out there. So many big stars came out of that club. And uh, comedy was very different in those days. First of all, there was no cable, so comedy was clean in those days, right. mostly, uh, because if you wanted to do television, you couldn't, you, you couldn't say anything or you know, off color. I hear that. Do you feel yeah. like do you feel like clean comedy is not as funny as let's say uh, the dirty comedy? I you know heard, what? I've, I've it depends. That. It depends on where you are. Like sometimes, you know, I had to perform with Jerry Seinfeld in the room recently, and I work basically clean. But every once in a while, I'll throw in an f bomb mm. uh, because I appreciate you saying the f bomb because we have kids listening today. Yeah, so. yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I don't curse. I, I don't like. And I never talk about anything ugly. I'm concerned about where comedy is going, and I'll get to that. But you know. I go back in comedy long enough that Milton Berle was my sponsor in the Friars Club. I oh, was a gosh. member of the Friars Club, and he gave it. Gaging himself here, Jeffrey. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm just a kid. Though. He found the Friars Club and gave it to the to the Friars. You know, he actually bought that building for his wife. It's a gorgeous building on 55th Street between Park and Madison. 
And and I, I got to meet all the comedians from that golden age. I wrote for Jerry Lewis and I worked with Henny Youngman and people who your listeners probably never heard of. But they came from the golden yeah, age. Yeah, listeners of all ages here, Jeffrey. Come well, on. Well, that's good. All I'm right. glad to hear that, you know. <laughs> but um, so comedy was very different in those days because comedians uh, told jokes. They really told jokes. These days, they're storytellers, and comedy has gotten very mean, and I talk about that a lot. Mm. Now, I wrote for the Friars Roast for many years. I was the main writer for about 12 years for the Friars Roast, and Friars Roasts are notoriously raunchy. But what I would do is I would go up to the person being honored, and they were all big stars, Hugh Hefner, Chevy Chase, you know, uh, sure. Br- Bruce Willis, Jerry Lewis, and I got to write for all of them. But I would go up to them first and I would say, is there anything that you're sensitive about that you don't want people to joke about? Because my intention was I never wanted to hurt anybody's feelings. These days they have roast battles where they purposely try to hurt your feelings. It's two comedians telling jokes about each other. And if someone has cancer, they use that as the focus of the jokes. If someone's parent just passed away, that's a big joke to them. And to me, I find that offensive. Now, some people say, well, there's no limits in comedy. You can say whatever you want. Right. I don't agree that. with that. I, you know, and, and I see the audiences seem to love it. And I think they laugh out of embarrassment sometimes. I don't know. I just find fault with it. I don't see that it's necessary to make fun of those kind of things. Mm. And, but that's where comedy is going. Roast battles. And they're very popular. And they're on TV. And they're in the clubs. And I cover the comedy scene. I'm out almost every night at just about every comedy club in the city because I write a column uh, in a big comedy website called The Interrobang, and it comes out every Monday, and I tell what's going on in comedy. So like last week, I was at the 92nd Street Y. Nick Kroll and John Mulaney were there. Very nice. And uh, you know they had this show on Broadway called Oh Hello, and they had me open the show for them. Do you know about Too Much Tuna? No, but I, I, okay, I'm a well, big tuna I, fan. I'm the very first you guy too much tuna. to be pranked with too much tuna. They do a, they did a show. Nick Kroll had a show on Comedy Central called Kroll Show. And he and John Mulaney dress up as these characters called the Oh Hello Boys. There, it's, uh, Nick is Gil Faison and John Mulaney is George St. Geegland. And part of what they do, they play pranks on people. They invite you to lunch in a diner and they give you a tuna fish sandwich that's about a foot high. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and they call it too much tuna. Music to and my ears. I'm the very first. I was. I, they brought me out to L.A. to be on the show on Comedy Central, and they pranked me with too much tuna. And mine went viral because I refused to be pranked. I'm like, this is how I like my tuna. And <laughs> I said, there's too much potato salad and there's too much fruit salad, but the tuna's perfect. Beautiful. And, and, they're like, common. and they're like, there's cameras all around you. And I said, I'm not looking. I'm not looking. And they said, uh, we're pranking you. And I'm like, no, you're not. So I refused to be pranked, and it went viral, and I became the first guy to be pranked with too much tuna. And then everybody in Hollywood got pranked with too much tuna. So every July, we go up to Montreal for something called the Just for Laughs Festival. It's the biggest comedy festival in the the world. Yeah, and I've been going for like 25 years. And I got to give the tuna sandwich to Judd Apatow who, if you know who that is, he's the king of Hollywood. He produces every movie. He just produced uh, Amy Schumer's Trainwreck movie all right. recently, and he did 40-Year-Old sure, Virgin sure, and Knocked yeah. Up. He does all the big comedies with Jonah Hill. and you know. So, uh, so anyway, I lost my train of thought. That's what but I was telling you about, about how comedy so, has yeah. changed, that I cover the comedy scene. Yeah. And comedy has changed a lot over the years. You know, It really has. Got that right, and I mean, do you do you going back to the topic of you're saying how um, you know comedy seems like now it's taking a direction of more of attacking the person and using their weaknesses as parts it's, of jokes. It's mean spirited. It's you feel like it's mean spirited. What? How do you think? What's the best way? How can we elevate um, the, the comedy world, or what are you doing in your own way to to bring a certain light to to that to that world and to that platform? What I do, I just show up. You know, uh, there's a thing about attraction, not promotion. You know, I I, li- I try to live my life according to certain spiritual principles, which is why I wrote the new book that I wrote about happiness. I try to bring that into everything that I do. I can't change what other people do. You know, I can only document it, which I write about, you know. Uh, it's interesting to see that audiences like that. But, you know, 
it's interesting too because there's a lot of people in this country right now who cannot wait to be offended by something. Everybody is offended, you know, and the country is torn apart by that. Political correctness has gone overboard, and now a lot of the comedians are starting to fight back. They're doing very politically incorrect shows, and they tell people, if you don't like it, you can leave. And no one leaves because the audience really likes that, you know. They're, they're a, I look at comedy as a healing force. It's an opportunity to bring everybody together. There are comedians like, I always use the example of Russell Peters. I don't know if you know Russell Peters, sure. but he's an Indian comic from Canada with no accent. He imitates every single accent. He's hilarious. He fills stadiums. 20,000 people come out to see this guy. And I can, I'm happy to say he's a good friend of mine. And when I go to see his shows, the audience is filled with people from every country. And everybody's laughing at themselves and then at each other. What do you think his secret sauce is? Well, because he comes from a good place. People are smart. They know. You can tell if somebody's coming from a place of hate or a place of love. You know, that's what's frustrating about things like that. Everybody's offended, but sometimes people are just saying things. They don't mean it in a bad way. And in comedy, you have to be able to laugh at yourself. Most right. comedians do self-deprecating humor. We do the kind of stuff like if, if you said Big that about me... Burnham. Pardon me? Bo Burnham, are you familiar with yeah, his comedy? Yeah, he's oh, a friend. Young yeah. kid, he's, he's yeah. really rocking it. He's killing Well, he's producing stuff yeah. now. He's producing specials for, sure. for Netflix. He produced specials. Jared Carmichael's, uh, I think it was his HBO special. Mm. Uh, he's doing a lot of big and specials. A, and he's, a deep, he's deep. And he has his segments go really deep and really far. And I mean, I think on his, uh, on his uh, document, one of his uh, specials, he goes out and says, like, um, how is this getting really hard for him? And he's like... He wants to bow out, but then I hear something about how he's. It was just all a show. Like he's actually totally, totally um, in a good place in his mind and and all that. But don't you find? I find he's a very rare talent. Very rare. Way. Very unique. Right. What were you gonna say? Don't I was I, saying the um, when it comes to comedy, I feel like a lot of comedians, um, and I know you've worked with like Robin Williams and such. A lot of comedy comes from a lot of comedians come from like a lot of dark places, and they have they struggle with those demons, and. What 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 are your thoughts on that whole like um, you know uh, paradox of you know here are these people you know yourself a comedy and you're surrounded by so many comedians who are whose main focus is to make people smile to make them laugh and yet we hear all these stories and we hear how these um, a lot of comedians are struggling with um, a lot of mental illness depression, depression yeah comedy and such very often people say that comedy comes from pain there are some comedians who go on stage and use it almost like a therapy session. They talk about their lives. You know, Jim Carrey will do stuff like that. Uh, th there, are, there are comedians who really open up. There are a lot of comedians who are not as well known who do that as well. And you really feel like you're listening to a therapy session. Mark Maron took his depression and became a huge star. When he did, uh, he did a show, his first show was uh, Scorching the Earth. And I was there for that. And he divulged such personal things that people in the audience, I myself, I felt embarrassed to listen to it. It was amazing. But it took, it catapulted him to another level. Anytime you can be honest enough with your audience, whether you're performing comedy or speaking or even doing what we're doing, if you can talk about personal things, other people can relate to it. There's only so many things that a human being can go through. You know, we all feel that we're unique, but we all have, you know, common experiences. And again, I talk about that a lot in my book. Um, and any time that you can open yourself up and really be honest about things that you've been through, it helps people. It gives them courage. Like I talk a lot about being a stutterer. I stuttered very badly until I was in my 20s and even beyond. And I stuttered so badly that I couldn't even say my name. I could never say Gurian. Uh, most stutterers have a hard time saying their name. And it's a, it's a very humiliating and embarrassing disability to have and um, my parents took me for speech therapy and nobody was able to help me and one day I realized that I didn't stutter when I was alone I only stuttered when I was trying to talk to somebody else and I feel I was given the grace to figure out that there was really nothing wrong with me you can't have a disability based on your location you know what I mean? If a man has a limp, he limps in every room of his house. He can't go into a room and close the door and walk perfectly. But if I could go into a room by myself and speak perfectly, then it means there's really nothing wrong with me. And it was in my mind. I created it. 
And so what I had to do, I worked on myself for years. I was determined not to go through my life as a stutterer. And I worked on it. I took my mind apart, basically, and I examined all my thoughts. And I realized that I was holding thoughts that were not valid for me, as many of us are. Many of us are holding thoughts that work against us. We self-sabotage ourselves. We don't allow ourselves to be as great as we could be. And very often those thoughts were given to us by people who didn't care about us, who didn't have our best interests at heart. Sometimes we were bullied as children. And a lot of us were bullied as children. Were you bullied as, as a child? I'm sure I was. I don't remember specific incidents, but I'm sure I was. I, and I bullied myself. There were times when I didn't feel like I fit in. Mm. I was very young when I went to school. I started school at four and a half, and then I skipped a grade. I was 16 in college, so I was much younger than the other people. But yet, I, I won. I was the president of the freshman class. And I ran, and I told myself at the time, if I could win the election, I wouldn't have to stutter anymore. And I won the election, and it was a great lesson for me because it taught me that outside validation doesn't work. It doesn't matter how many people tell you that you're wonderful and talented. It matters what you think of yourself. And that, that has been like a, a driving force for me. It's how I cured myself. As you can hear, I no longer stutter. It's incredible. And as an avocation, I work with people who stutter, and I teach them how not to stutter, how to change your thought. And I keep bringing up my book, but I want to focus on that because it's important to me. My book is called Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind, A Spiritual and Humorous Approach to Achieving Happiness. And it's important that we examine our thoughts so that we can see what thoughts are not working for us. Every time in your life that you have to make a decision, you use your thoughts to figure out what to do, right? Who else's thoughts can you use? You, you think to yourself, what should I do? But if your thoughts are faulty, your decisions are not going to work for you. And that's the essence of the book, is that we need to be able to examine your thoughts objectively, which is a very hard thing to do, to look at your thoughts and see if you're holding thoughts that tell you that you're not good enough, that you're a loser, that, that, that you're not meant to be anything great. And again, a lot of those messages were given to us by people, and we believe them. Mm -hmm. And I call them heart wounds. Anytime anyone has ever lied to you or broke a promise to you, or hurt your feelings in some way, they broke up with you in a relationship, you carry that inside of you in your heart chakra. And I call them heart wounds. And they stay with you. They affect your self-confidence. They affect your self-esteem. And they affect every decision you make. And those are the things that we have to work on in order to achieve happiness. You have to release them and let them go. And it's a process. It's an interesting process. And it takes a lot of work. But you can do it. And I use my stuttering as an example. And when I talk about that, it's not, it's not just about stuttering. It's about overcoming obstacles in your life. Every person is given obstacles that they have to overcome. Sometimes we're being tested in order to get to higher levels. You have to show that you're worthwhile, that you can overcome. Some people crumble because of their problems, and some people rise above them. Right, you sure. Know? And you have a choice in life. And so... Uh, I always admire people who can create change in their life. It's easy to stay the way you are. It's very hard to make a change. And some people, they have the grace and the ability to do that. And I'm always fascinated by that. To what, me, that's amazing. What were some major changes that you did in your own life that shifted the way you were, you know, in this case, I say stuttering, that took you from be, you know, experiencing stuttering to not? And what are some tips and guidelines you could give to those who are listening? Well, you have to evaluate yourself in an honest way. You know, you have to look at your good and bad points. I remember making a list of all the things I liked about myself and all the things I didn't like about myself. And what I found was that the, the list of things that were good about me outweighed the things that I didn't like. What I had to do was basically take an inferiority complex, which I don't know where it came from, and turn it into a superiority complex, not to feel better than other people, but just to feel even just to show up, you know. Um, I liken it to like a piece of paper. If you have a piece of paper that is folded in half, yep. in order to get rid of the fold, you have to fold it the opposite way, 180 degrees, so the paper is flat again. And that's how I look at it. And I have this thing that I carry with me that I'd like to read because it's about fear. Fear is one of the things that stops us. And there, there's a, this was from a book that Marianne Williamson wrote, uh, which is just an amazing... It's an amazing statement to me. And if you don't sure. mind, I'd just like to yeah, read it please, quickly. Please. It's a, it says, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. 
Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that others won't feel insecure around you. We were born to manifest the glory within us. It's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. To me, this is the most powerful statement that wow. I've ever read. I carry it with me every day. You can see how That's worn amazing. Yeah, this looks paper worn is. Out the paper that you, and you carry that wherever you go. I carry it wherever I go. I believe that, that you internalize things that you carry with you. And it's so important to me because it means that you're allowed to be successful. You're allowed to be a superstar. I used to make believe I didn't know the answer in school because I didn't want the other kids to think I thought I was smart. Not that I was smart, that I thought I was smart. I, if the teacher called on me, I would say, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Because even though you did. I, even though I did, because I didn't want to outshine other people. I held myself back. I self-sabotaged. And I did that in a way for many years until I realized it wasn't necessary. Because if you become successful, then you become an inspiration to other people. You don't, over, you don't outshine them. It's the other way. You right. can become an inspiration and show them what's possible. That if you did it, they can do it as well. Absolutely, yeah. and so and that's why it's so powerful. That it's it's not our it's not our darkness. It's our light that we're afraid of very often, you know. So I use that as a guide as I go through life to say, look, it took me many years to get the nerve to go out on stage and perform. Sure, I'm one of the very few doctors who has a long-standing career in comedy, and I wrote for many big stars, but I couldn't get out on stage and perform until the last 12 or 15 years. I didn't have the nerve, because if you start in comedy... You mostly stick to writing. To writing for people. Behind the scenes. And everybody would say, hey, you should go out and perform, and th I didn't have the courage to do it, because if you start in your 20s, nobody knows you, so you have the freedom to bomb. You know, which is how you get better. You go sure. out in the beginning, you're not so good, and you keep doing it and doing it until you get better and better. But by the time I was ready to do it, too many people knew me because I had written for some famous people. You know, I wrote for Rodney Dangerfield and Joan Rivers mm -hmm. and Phil Hartman and George Wallace. I wrote for a lot of well-known people. And so I was nervous to go out on stage because people expected a lot of me, and I expected a lot of me. And then I had to do that thing in my mind that it's okay and I gave myself permission to go out, and now I perform all the time. Beautiful, and you can't stop. And I can't stop, even if I want. Sometimes I'm on stage, and I'm like, why am I even doing this? It's a very hard thing to do, to go out on stage and try to convince strangers that what you think is funny is funny. It's, it's the hardest thing. It's a thing. crazy thing. I, I try to go. I, I, sh I shared the stage in uh, Israel with a few uh, comedians, and I was up there for five minutes sharing the stage, not alone, and it was like the longest five minutes of my life. It was oh, you're so Jewish. I'm Jewish. <laughs> we'll give it That's away. why the yarmulke makes sense now. The yarmulke and the beer. I was wondering what that is. It makes perfect sense. That's yeah. it. That's it. I was trying to give a crack at the comedy world. Yeah. You know, they say it was Jewish humor and all, but I was. Um, it was very difficult. It was a. It was a really grounding experience, and I really it's came very, to appreciate. People don't know. They comedians think on the level. They think if you're funny with your friends, like people come up to you, they say, "You should meet my friend. He is so funny." And right. then you meet the guy, and he's like, "Yeah." You know, there's a big difference between being funny with your friends and being funny on stage. Absolutely. Oh, for you know? sure. Here you go. have to have something to say on stage. You have to have a point of view. I don't talk about politics. I don't talk about anything. I, I talk about things that strike me funny. That's great. Gosh, we're moving into politics. Right? No, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I don't talk about the thing. You know, I don't talk about things that are divisive. I talk about things that just that everyone can relate to that they think are funny. You know, everyone has a different style. And that's what I do. I don't really talk about myself too much. That's why this book was interesting. It's the first time that I actually opened up about my life, mm -hmm. you know, to talk about personal things and overcoming painful things in your life and how to change that, you know, my divorce, like just all kinds of things that a lot of people don't often talk about. I gave a new perspective. All right, that's great. So thank you, Jeffrey, for uh, sharing your story and, and bringing your book out here and, and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, for those who are listening, how could they find you on social media and you have a website and all that? Yes, I do. I, I'm all over the internet. Uh, my, my website is comedymatterstv.com. 
and you'll see all kinds of stuff on there, everything. And if you look under the About column, it's not only about showbiz. Uh, there's a lot of that on there. But if you go under the About column, you'll also see a section on spirituality and healing and on my techniques about stuttering and techniques about uh, headache control. It's all you know in that section. Uh, I have a, a YouTube channel called Comedy Matters TV coming up on 2 million views, uh, interviews, video interviews with everybody in comedy from Jimmy Fallon to Chelsea Handler, Amy Schumer, uh, Amy Poehler, even women not named Amy. Um, <laughs> that I have uh, John Mayer, Dave Chappelle, every big comedy star is on my channel. And in order to find that, you go to youtube.com slash Gurian News Network, G-U-R-I-A-N is the Nancy, Gurian News Network. And you'll see fun interviews with all your favorite comedy stars on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at Jeffrey Gurian, and um, just put my name in, and it's going to pop up. You'll see more about me than you want to know. That's it. I'm all over the you place. Stick out, man. You yeah, stick out. and so uh, yeah, and so uh, oh, and if if you have if you want to reach me, I don't mind. I'll give my email Jeffrey at JeffreyGurian dot com. So thanks very much, and, and it was great to be on with you. Really, lots thank of fun. You. Thank you, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. Then for those who are watching, thank you for listening and watching to the end of this podcast. It was very exciting to share Jeffrey and having Jeffrey in the studio. Check us out, subscribe, and if you found anything that's of interest and valuable for yourself or a friend, do share it with them. Sharing is caring. And like I always say, stay positive, be happy. I'm Mayor Kay. Have a great day.